from us is a true heart of worship. When that's real to us, it will bleed into every other area of our lives. And which I don't know why sometimes you're struggling to get through the valley, is because you're not worshiping enough. That's the fuel in your spiritual tank. You pray to get direction. You worship to fill yourself up. See, this is a relationship. See, y'all, many of y'all maybe dated before. You date God. This is communication. You know when you, you write letters or you, you write Valentine's Day letters, you, 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 you sweet nothings in her ear in his ear? That's what the word, that's what hallelujah is. That's that sweet nothing in his ear. You know when you want God to get out like, ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> that he has, he, he created a word just for something, just for nobody but him. And when you utter it out of your soul, sometimes you don't even verbally say it, just your soul is crying hallelujah to him. I gotta tell this testimony before we get started, even though the worship team just robbed me of 30 minutes. I went this weekend, and when we wrestled last week, God said, I'm about to turn the corner for the house, and everything you need gonna be laid out. So I'm like, okay, Lord, you know how when God says something sometimes, you receive it. <laughs> so I went this week, and I'm going and I'm looking at, we needed a stove for the kitchen, the stove was just not right. And so I'm looking for a stove, I found one for a few hundred bucks, so I inboxed the gentleman, uh, the lady, whoever paid him, said, hey, we would love to have this. Is it great? It's great, Samsung, nice, high-end thing, yeah. I'm saying, well, it's for our church. I'm going to come grab it. They're like, oh, it's for a church. Oh, man, just come get it. <laughs> so we got there, and I'm talking to the gentleman and the lady. There's a couple of them. And, and he's telling me, and I, I, somebody better grab hold to what you need from God right here. He said, I got fired in January. He said, and I told my boss when they got fired, when he fired me, God will provide. He said, so what happened after that is I found a new job making more money. He said, but the job didn't start for about a month or two. He said, so the old job realized, oh, we need him. So they called him back and said, here, we're going to have part-time hire you at, on the side. And, but we're going to pay you through all the way till you start your other job. And then we need to keep you some for the, for, we need to keep you some. So then what, see, see what happens is when God lets something get shaky in our life, when a storm comes, we get to tripping. We, we, we get to tripping. When it's a storm in your life, baby, it's time for an upgrade. It's upgrade time. See, Peter, they seen it as a storm, but Jesus said, I'm just about to walk on water for him. I'm about to show him. When they seen Lazarus as dying, but he said, be glad that he did. Because you're about to really see me now. When it's a storm in your life, when they throw you in the fire, just know it's upgrade time. See, one thing that Pastor King, she didn't want to use up on our time, but the best part of the story to me is they came out the fire not even smelling like smoke. See, when God puts you through something, you don't even come out smelling the same. You don't even smell like what you've been through. You don't look like what you've been through. Your clothes ain't burnt up and you don't even have a stench. I'm trying to get us some word where we get to a real place of a heart posture with God, of worship. Sometimes we're so stuck on life, what can I get or what I need? We forget, you have the King of Kings, as the one of God said, and the Lord of Lords. Is that enough? Listen, you won't need rent, you won't need a house, you won't need a car, you won't need a job sooner than you think. The average age is about 83, I think it went up to 85, the average age of a human. And even if y'all live to 85, trust me, that's coming quick. And you won't even need half the stuff you're tripping about right now. And you're going to spend eternity in heaven, and it won't be no water bill. And it sure won't be no light bill, thank the Lord. Yeah, yeah. The stuff that the enemy gets us to trip out about right now, we won't even need soon enough. And he gets us to abandon worship because we got a little issue. He gets us to abandon a posture before God of, of humility because we got something, we got to go do this and work or do this or go to work or overtime or something. Now, but it get to a place in your life that I don't, Sundays is untouchable. When it's my time with God, it's untouchable. Y'all got to get to a mature level in your life. I know some of y'all got a job, y'all work on Sundays. Y'all better start praying. Like, Lord, I need to be in your house. I need to be with your people. He'll open up a door for you on that. I guarantee you he will. If your posture is right, God, I need to be with you and your people, 
Now, I got to get to a point in life at this point where nothing else, he's at, the, he's at a place in your life where it is an untouchable spot. Because we're living in a different world now. And they robbed me of 30 minutes. Now y'all going to be mad at me. Like, I was the one left y'all here until 3.30. We got a word today. And it's so important that I, I'm going to keep that little soft music on. Maybe y'all hearts will stay open. Because I watched this for some months now, it's six or seven different occasions. And even though I had this lesson lined up, I'm glad I'm in this series where God just kind of let me, whenever, let's, I'm gonna grab one out the queue. I got all these lessons for me, I'm just grab one out the queue as we go. As I see the house needs to be taught, as I see the house needs, this needs to be addressed. This is a very important one today. And I'm gonna just leave a little soft music on so I can tell it to y'all. Because this is gonna be a hard one. But this, is one of the most important topics in the Bible. And a lot of us gonna have to face some things today. If you hear, you hear for a reason. Because this will interrupt your entire relationship with God. We've been in a, this, this series called what? I like that, that's the word a year ago. All right, I, I like that, they used to do Class of the Kingdoms, Culture versus Christ. And I, through these weeks we've been examining what culture says versus what Christ says. What the enemy wants you to do versus what the kingdom asks for you to be and do. And today we got to do with one. Week seven, three strikes versus safe. Are you a safe place? And the important part about this, this clause is are you a safe place for God? And I'm going to get ahead of myself in my notes because a lot of us think that we can love God and treat his people any kind of way. But how if I dogged half of y'all kids out and they came and tried to hang with y'all, y'all wouldn't hang with me. Because if my kids ain't welcome, I'm not coming. If you can't treat my kids right, you can't get me. Yet we think for one moment that we can treat God's other children any kind of way and think we're going to have a right relationship with him. And, and the thing about this clause is, are you a safe place for God? Because he says, when you do it to the least of them, you've done it to me. How they know you are my true disciples is by how you love one another. And we come how I keep having that disconnect between our relationship with God and other people. And I can guarantee you, it's exactly the same. And a lot of us are think our life is going good and think it's going good and we're about to hit a rude awakening. One thing God cannot stand is when his children treat each other like trash. Because I don't know about y'all, y'all may be horrible parents, but me, if both of my kids are beefing and they come to me, they gonna get the same energy from me from both of them. Because until y'all get it together, you don't get me. You don't get my blessings and you don't get my provision until y'all figure it out. And when y'all figure it out, then I'm all in what y'all need. Take the keys, take the credit card, take whatever you need. But we gotta talk about this one today. Yeah, some years ago um, on the internet, I seen one of the most beautiful things I've ever, ever seen on the internet. Uh, a, 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 a woman officer, drunk officer, I assume she was intoxicated, came home to her apartment and she busted in the wrong apartment. And she shot a man while he was sitting playing Nintendo in his own apartment. And she, because she was intoxicated, walked into the wrong door and assumed he was in her house and shot and killed the man. And what got me is when I watched the court case on it, the, 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 the young brother of the, the victim, what he did when he was on the stand. Thank you, D-Man. Give me, give, go ahead and give me that video of a victim hugging the person that just murdered her brother. And what gets me is the judge, he said, please. Because when he was sitting up there, he was seeing her suffer and cry in the courtroom. And his only concern in that moment was, don't you wrong me something I can never get back. I'm, a, I, I'm more concerned about what you're going through right now. Now, if I let the video keep going, he tried to let her go, but she kept holding him, so he held her back. At that very moment, he was selfish, and he wasn't thinking about anything. He just happened to him no matter what, even though, not no matter, even though what had just happened to him was brutal. I can't get my brother back, and he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was a great man. And in that moment, he showed the love of God. And forgave her. Said, I don't wish nothing bad on you. I don't want to see nothing bad happen about you. I love you. 
Now, I don't know if this man is Christian or not, but I just want to believe that he absolutely is. And what I want to tell you out of today, I guess I wrote this purpose. You must forgive and forget. See, like, but I forgive, but I never forget where well, you can never please God. We've made our own three strikes, you out. You mess with me, you out of my life. I'm going to put you out of my life. But, uh, but God says safe. I, everybody should be safe with you. Because what I don't understand and I can't for the life of me understand is how we dog out God like we do. Every day. And then turn around and think we can hold somebody else accountable for what they did to us. We spit in God's face every single day. We fornicate, we run around, we kick it, we don't tithe, we don't do anything, we don't give, we don't serve him, we don't read his Bible, we don't fast, we don't pray, and then we'll be, I love you, Jesus, on Sunday. I love you, Jesus. And he's like, I love you too, come on. And let somebody step on your shoe. And I got to slow down because I, I want, we need, we better grasp this. And I'm going to show you in the text that how extremely important this is. Because a lot of us is going to live a lie. Thinking that we good with God. And this is what we do too. I have forgave them. I don't feel nothing. And it's funny because when you start to be in neglect, or you start to literally not even understand you holding something, now it's getting into bitterness. Now it's so deep that you're covering it up because, see, I don't think it's a seed in the ground if I'll wrap it over with a bunch of soil inside. But there's some stuff growing under there that's dangerous. It's some mold in the wall. And if you don't be honest with yourself and realize I got to deal with this, you're going to set yourself up for failure. Point one. Go to them. Now, I'm going to go to the word of God. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 19. This is read when you get ready to get... When Jesus is talking, listen, if another believer sins against you, go privately, privately, and point out the offense. Now, here we go. Privately, I mean, you got to go put them in the room, but y'all too. The word, the principle here is don't dog them out. Don't try to have your, your confession talk in front of everybody and embarrass them. It should be something where you're protecting the conversation and protecting your brother or your sister privately. It should be a conversation where you privately deal with this because the, the, the point here, the goal is to actually win your brother or sister back. We're about to read. So you, you do it in private so y'all can really, so it's not any outside influences and you're not interested in having a fan, a fan club with you when you do it. Watch. He says, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won the person back. That's the goal, to win the person back. Watch what he says next, verse 16. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back so that everything may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. He said you should be so concerned with trying to make things right. If they don't want to hear you the first time, take back two or three witnesses. Take back two or three witnesses so everything can be confirmed because your goal, I'm trying to win my brother back. I'm trying to win my brother back. He don't want to let me in, so I got to take witnesses now because of what's going to happen next. He says, verse 17, if the person still refuses to listen, Take your case to the church. That's when you bring it to me. That's when you bring it to Pastor Kenya, Pastor Anthony. That's when you take it to Minister E. That's when you take it to Pastor Penny. That's when you take it to Pastor Jordan. And you find an elder in the church. That's when you find another one of the elders. In the I need your help dealing with this because I'm keep trying to apologize, change on it. Listen, can we have a meeting? First private, then take some witnesses. Then go to the elders of the church. It's a, it's a church issue now. Now watch what he says. Then if, she or she, if he or she won't accept the church's decision, Treat that person as a pagan or corrupt tax collector. Now, I've heard this before. Uh, I remember some years ago, I told a young gentleman, hey, I showed him this scripture. I said, go back again. Make it right. He said, well, I already got the, uh, the translation for that. It's time to cut them out of my life. I said, how do we treat pagan tax collectors? We don't cut them out of our life. We, uh, we have to understand that this, this is what it's saying. At this moment, you understand you can't be a believer. Because you won't accept my apology, you won't listen to the church, you won't submit to none of that stuff. Now I have to treat you like an unbeliever. So what, you, what do we do with unbelievers? We love them. We're trying to win them back even more and first into the love of Christ. We don't get to cut people out of our life. And the point, of no, the point one is go to them. Too many of us are holding on to stuff because we don't want to go to nobody. I don't be, I, she may not respond. Go to them. This is mature Christian talk now. I ain't, don't make or break my life. You'd be surprised how stuff will come back around. 
We cut people out thinking that we have the right to do it. Let God cut you out for what you did. Then we'll think he was an unjust God and mean to us and not fair to us. Watch this. Verse 18. I'm going to tell you why this is so important and, and all through this lesson. I tell you the truth. I'm not lying. No cap. That's what he's saying. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I'm giving you heavenly authority to back this. But watch what he says in the last verse. I also tell you this. If two, or, if, two or, if you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered together as my fathers, among, uh, as my fathers I, I'm there among you. This is why it's so important for us to be in unity with each other. He says the, the, how I built it is when two or three got together, I'm in the middle. I'm in the midst of it. Whatever y'all agree here, until y'all get to start agreeing on stuff, I'm going to do it for you. So if nobody's in unity, if nobody, if nobody forgives, nobody's no agreement, and I ain't moving. I, I don't get a chance to move. How I work is when y'all agree, I come into that unity. Like, my, like me, my Father, and the Holy Spirit do, we come into oneness and wreck the whole world and shake up the world and save you from your sins. The concept is that y'all come down here and replicate that in your unity. Go to him. Go to your brother. No forgiveness, no unity. No agreement, no, no forgiveness, no unity. If, you're not, if, if, if there is no unity, there's no agreement. And if there's no agreement, God is not blessing. He can't bless nothing. Point two. You don't get to hold on to anything. Let it go. You don't have the right to hold on to anything. Let it go. And I'm trying to say anything because I don't care what happened to you. I'm, I, I'm sensitive because y'all done been through some stuff. But that has no bearing and no, what God say, let it go. I came down here and died on a cross for, for stuff I didn't even do. And if I can let it go and save you from your sins, you can too. Let it go. It should be never sometime you sit and talk about what happened to me. What they did to me. They took this. I was a just this. I'm a this. Let it go. Let me give you scripture. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Now pay attention to this. Don't judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Now I love this. In the Lord's prayer, he says, Forgive, uh, he, in the Lord's prayer, when the disciples say, teach us how to pray, he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, worthy be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In the, how he ta- the framework of how to pray, he said, you should be praying about for, how you know you got a mature believer. This is an easy way you see how you got a mature believer in Christ. Watch how they seek and give forgiveness. Forgive those, forgive me for my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. It's a part, it's a point as we should be seeking it out. Seeking out how to make things right with our brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, forgive others and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your life, the amount you give, you, the amount you give will determine the amount you give back. Now, we always use that for, like, the giving time. Press down, shaking together and rubbing over. Or men giving to your bosom. Y'all want to know what that actually in context is talking about? How you treat people. Because a lot of y'all are going to go through stuff and are going through stuff because how you did people. You was a whole bully in high school. Clowned everybody. Oh, now it's your turn to get embarrassed. Now you're praying, Lord, give me about this situation. This is life. No, 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 no. You sold that. He says, what you give others, oh, make no mistake, it's coming back. He says, watch. Then Jesus, verse 39, gave the following instructions. Can a blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students are, they, are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. Verse 41, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? You so be trying to say what they doing wrong. Look at your life. Look at where you came from. Look at how you dog people, cheat on people, cheated people, did all kind of stuff, lied on your taxes. Let's look at what you do while you trying to check everybody else what they did to you. He says, he says, he says, he says, how can you, verse 42, how can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? 
This is red. It says hypocrite. How dare some of us really have the, have the mouth to say what somebody else is doing or what they should be doing or what they did to us or what they did to them. If you have a log in your eye, you're blind. You can't see. And that's the part that's the problemsome and troublesome. Some of us can't even see the mess we do. We can't even see the people that we're holding on to and we're holding hostage in our life. We don't even see it because we're blind. But yet we're trying to tell everybody else what they need to do and what they're doing. He says, hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. When we, when, we, when we don't forgive, we claim to be God in that moment. When we say, I'm not forgiving them, I'm not doing this, I'm not making it right with them, we claim at that moment that we are God and we have the right to dismiss a person. What that verse start with? Judge, unless you judge not, unless you be judged. And don't take that scripture and run around and start clicking it to my, don't judge me. That is not what that meant. What did it say? He says, get yourself together first and then... It's, un, it's righteous judgment. It's the problem. Un, unrighteous judgment, that's the problem. It's not, we hold each other accountable to exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And get rid of all these yes man friends. No matter what you say, yeah, I understand, yep. That's really why you like them to be your friend, because they don't hold you accountable. Because half of us should be like, girl, I understand you went through it, but homeboy, I understand but what your pops did, but... um. Yeah, but a lot of us too scared to do that. I'm going to mess up our friendship. Yeah, so it's like, uh, you be really trippy. Like, dude, why you overdo house? We too scared to talk to our friend like that. We going to lose my friend. But you see your, if you, how can you say you love them if you see them about to hurt their life and you don't do nothing about it? You see what they're, they're on a dangerous path, and you don't want them because you're worried about they're going to skip their they, they crab leg nights with you. You're going to worry about you ain't going to have nobody to come over, have a wine and paint and sit with no more. You can't say you love them, but you're not going to say, man, I'm not trying to be your business, I, I promise, but what I'm saying says you need to stop that. And a lot of us are scared to hold each other accountable. Watch this. Verse Matthew, verses 16, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. I want to break this down. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Watch this, verse 15. This is important. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you of your sins. Let me break this down. First thing, he's not talking about salvation. This is a relationship talk. The payment for sin was done away with on the cross of Christ. He's saying now we won't have no relationship. If you can't build a relationship with the people you're around you and forgive them, I don't want a relationship with you. If you're not forgiving them from their sins in your life, I won't be forgiving you for yours. Do not treat them like crap, not forgive them, hold on to stuff, then turn around and pray to me. Let me break down forgiveness too. I did forgive them. When a part, when you, let me pray. Let me, let me get right Let's say Pastor Jordan owes me $700. And I say, I forgive you of this debt you owe me. And then next Sunday, I say, where's my money? Or the next Sunday, I say, I don't hang with him. Because he, ain't get, he don't get my money now. In that story, I never told you he wasn't paying it. He just owed me. But we'll, I'll put a judgment. I, you don't owe me this no more. But if I turned around and demanded he gave it to me and or treated him some type of way, well, you still owe me. The, the 700 just turned in from a financial debt to a spiritual, emotional, mental, mental one. Now I'm going to treat you, I feel like I have the right to treat you a certain way because of a wrongdoing or because I say I forgave him. But what it is, if I really say I forgave you of the 700, I never mention it again. It don't change our relationship. It don't do anything because I forgave you. You no longer owe me anything. I've released you from a debt. I release you like Christ. We don't owe Jesus Christ anything. He's released us from the debt of the, the payment of sin. He's released us from We don't owe him anything. Salvation is free. Sanctification is not free. Holy living is not free. But the grace of God to cover your sins of your life is free through belief. If, if Jesus turned around when you got to the, to, the, to, to the judgment seat and started running off everything you did, 
and saying, yep, I remember you did that. And that he didn't really forgive us. He said, I'll separate your sins as far as the east from the west. He said, I'll throw them in the depths of the sea. That's how far away your sin, our sin, is removed from him because he forgave us of it. He no longer sees it. He had did away with it on the cross of Christ. It is a perfect lamb able to take away the sin so he doesn't have to deal with it anymore. It's not a gulf keeping us away from God anymore. When Jesus died, the veil ripped. It's no separation from us and God anymore. Our, 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 our ability to keep the law, our ability to live holy has no bearing on salvation. It has a bearing on relationship with him. It has burned on eternal reward. But through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is salvation given. If God said, I'm forgiving you for a debt, it's forgiven. And he's telling us to turn around and forgive each other the same way. Let stuff go. We don't get to hang on to anything. Now, let's talk about this real quick, too. Forgiveness and reconciliation is two different things. When you forgive somebody, you release them from this debt. They no longer owe you. When you see them, you don't act no type of way. You ain't doing nothing to them. You ain't hurting them. Now, the goal in the Bible is reconciliation. It's to reconcile with the person. Now, there's going to be times you can't reconcile. Number one, what if they're dead? What if your dad did you wrong? You never made him anything. He messed up your life because he never was there. But you can't fix it. He's dead. So forgiveness, you can't reconcile there. But God is saying, okay, reconciliation is not the requirement. It's, God, it's the goal forgiveness is. So now you're going to have to release yourself from some baggage and some ropes tied to you from the unforgiveness in your heart. But reconciliation is actually the goal, especially in the church. And I'm going to read some scriptures that show you that. The point is that you go to your sister, like you said in Matthew 18, and reconcile. Win your brother or sister back. And let go of the past. Let go of all the stuff they may have did or not did to you. Erase the debt. Like he erased your sin debt, erased the debt as if it never happened. And if you possible to reconcile, if you're alive and each person's heart is open to each other, come reconcile. But the reason why reconciliation never happens because we want to defend and battle. Well, you did this way, you did this. No, I didn't. You did this way. No, I didn't. And then Christ is like, y'all so busy trying to hold your ground. And when you don't forgive, you want somebody to apologize to you. They still, you think they owe you an apology, which means you haven't forgave them because they still in debt to you. They owe you. You still feel like they owe you something. You don't get to hold on to anything. And what the teacher, he's saying here is if you hold on to people that way, that's how I'm going to hold on to you. And a lot of us think we're walking with God. And we're just pleased, we're pleasing God because I come to church and I do all this stuff. He said, but you're holding my other children hostage, so I can't even have the relationship with you I need. Before I ever started this church, there's two things I had to do because I knew how serious God dealt with forgiveness and unforgiveness. And I knew I had forgiven in my heart, but I had to try my best to come reconcile and make sure because I wanted God with me so much. I knew I needed him. If he wanted me to do this, I needed you. So I had to go have these hard meetings. I set the meetings up, I, and, I, and I said, I'm not, I'm not here for you. To, you don't owe me nothing. I'm sorry. I mean, you're like, what I need to be sorry for? I ain't do nothing. See, that what my heart was, I wanted to reconcile with my brother and sister. So I said, I'm sorry. Because I, I don't know, I don't have no details to tell you what I did, but I know I did something. So I'm sorry if I wasn't the friend I was supposed to be. I'm sorry if I wasn't the son I'm supposed to be. I'm sorry if I wasn't the underling I was supposed to be. I'm sorry if I wasn't the friend I'm supposed to be. I'm, I'm truly sorry. I want, I want to make it right with you. I want to make it right with God. Because when I make it right with you, I do make it right with God. God said, if, he, if, I, if, if I love me, I'll treat my brother a certain way. And if I can treat my brother a certain way and love my brother a certain way, then he, I can be trusted with him. And I want to be trusted with him. So I need to be trusted with you. So we are the hands and feet of God. He ain't walking down Blue Ridge. It's, we are. So our goal is we represent Christ and we act in the, in the order of Christ as Christians, Christ-likeness. We treat each other how God treats us. That's why he gives us seed to the sower. The goal is that he's going to give it to us so we can take care of our brothers and sisters' needs. He's going to give us grace and love. Love people, each other, as I've example to you. The goal is that we get how he's treated us, how he's forgiven us, how he's been for us, how he's washed away our sins, how he's uh, uh, erased our mistakes, and go share that same energy with each other. 
But we think we can just dog everybody and cut everybody out of our life and then get with God. Me and God need my, protect my peace. And well, we have no clue how bad we're damaging our walk with God. We have no clue how far off we are with him. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1. Therefore, our prisoner for serving the Lord, Paul said to Ephesus, beg you. This is how serious he I'm begging y'all. He says, lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. I'm begging y'all, please live right, please. Now, a lot of us say, I do live right. I don't smoke and drink. Let's see what living your life according to your calling is. Verse 2, always be humble and gentle, patient with each other. Making allowances for each other's fault because of what? Because you love them. And why do you love them? Because God loves you. So it's going to funnel for you. He says make allowances. What's the root order of allowances? Allow. You should have a set in your life. I know people are going to do me wrong. I know people are going to do people wrong. Because, but it's how, and God, I know that. So when they happen to me, it's okay. I ain't no big deal. I got it. I forgive you. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God, don't worry about it. It should be built in you to release your brother and sister from debts as they come to you because you know that's how God does you. He said, I'm begging you to lead a life worthy of your calling. So here's what I need you to do. Be gentle and humble and patient with each other. We so many times say, well, I don't sin and I don't do this. What he rather you do is love each other. What he rather you do is serve each other. Why? Because if you really love each other, you won't even do the stuff to each other in the first place. Watch, he says, he says, Make, verse 3, every effort, make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Make every effort to be right with your brother and sister, to reconcile with them. It's not just forgiveness, to reconcile with them, binding each other together with the peace cord. Peace duct tape. That's how we do it. He says, he says, Binding yourself with peace, verse 4, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. It's the reason why he says, I'm not, a, I'm not a God prostitute. I'm not a God, I'm not, what's it when you got a lot of wives? I'm not a polygamist. I'm not going to be over here with you because you don't want to forgive her and then be over there with her on the other side, and I'm going to just be over here on both sides. It's one body, one spirit. So the same spirit is supposed to be in you, and the same spirit is supposed to be in her. So it's y'all supposed to be magnetic to each other. Y'all supposed to come together in unity because I'm one God. I want to see one bride. I have one bride, one body. One, I don't see seven million people that serve me. I see one group of people I'm going to come rapture, treating y'all all the exact same, giving y'all all the same grace, giving y'all all the same mercy, giving y'all all the same future, the same hope, the same. It's the same. How can y'all not get along? He says, he says, just as you have been called to one glorious hope and future for the future, I'm rapturing y'all together. He says, verse 5 and 6, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is living, over, who, is, who is over all, in all, and living through all. You got to let the old exit go. He did you wrong. He's he scandalous. Baby daddy did you scandalous. Let you raise that baby. All that time you want to pop up when they're 13. Come on, do you need help? Are you serious? Do I need help? Let it go. In the depths of your heart, repent. Like, Lord, I, when I see his face sometimes, I want to punch you. Lord, I'm sorry. That's not your heart. I'm not pleasing you because that's your son too. And even if they don't believe in you, you lead a 99 for the one. You care about them just as much. I'm sorry for having that heart posture against that person. I'm sorry I hold my dad, father, my father hostage, which I don't know. Is the more y'all hold them hostage, you holding yourself hostage. I talked about this last year. I sat in the stage where all these strings tied to me. And we tie strings all over our life, thinking we don't need nobody. And I had Pastor Ant come wrap a fat red cord around my neck. And boy, he was really working that analogy. He was yanking me like I was. It was good, too, because what we don't understand is exactly what's happening. That's why that person walking in the room, it irritates you. You dreaming about what they did to you 20 years ago because you haven't let it go. You still doing stuff to them because something they did to you 20 years ago because you haven't let it go. And God is saying you have no clue how you stopping my relationship with you. 
because you're praying to me to forgive you every Sunday, yet you won't let your brother and sister go. And all this mama, daughter, father, son, cousin, niece, neighbor, these relationships will be non-existent when that church is raptured. We will have our father and everybody will be on the same. You will see your mom and dad like, man, was my mom on earth? But you won't be no more. Mommies and daddies and husbands, you ain't married in heaven. Love Penny, but she won't be my wife in heaven. I'm going to be with my husband. He's going to sit on his throne. I'm going to be with the king of kings and the lord of lords. I'm going to be with him for eternity. It won't be no husbands then. It won't be no wives. It won't be no, we we're all just going to be brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. They say we are adopted into the family as joint heirs. Brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ up there with our father. All the relationship, all this stuff will be burnt up and non-existent anymore. And we literally will mess up our eternal blessing because we can't get it right here. Watch what Paul said in Ephesus when we jump down to 31 and 32. Get rid of all, all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander as we all, as we all, as we all, as we at, as we, as we all type, at, at, what the heck? As, as well as, as well as all types of behavior. So I, I'm going to show you all this one day. I put notes in my notes. So in the scripture, it's notes. I'll be trying to read both real quick, and it messes me up every time. As we all, 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 there we go again. As well as all types of behavior. I can't even read the note I got on here now. Now y'all know I'm saying it from a note that I wrote in a note. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, it got to be spontaneous. I gotta think I just came up with it. Verse 32. Instead, watch, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Now I got to read it again because this is important. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words. Get off Facebook subliminally posting about people. And slander. I ain't going to go to that one because y'all know how. They scandalous over here, going to try to read it in front of me as well, Pastor. As well as all types of evil behavior. He's talking about towards each other. He says, instead, let me show what you should be doing. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We should do this for one reason, because that's what Christ does to us. So that should fuel and motivate us to stop Everything else that's evil behavior in, in, in God's sight. Colossians 3, watch this, verse 12. Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must cloak yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Ain't that like the same thing he just said in Ephesians? Make allowance. He said, here we go again. Didn't he just say that to Ephesus? Now Colossae, he's saying the same thing to another church and another reason. Since God has chose you, he says, tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, make allowances for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Allowance? Anyone. So it don't matter who it is or what they did. Forgive them. He said, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must. I'm not asking you to do this. You must forgive others. He says, above all, cope yourselves with the love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Ain't that like one body, one spirit, one baptism? Sounds real, real, real repetitive because sometimes we hard-headed and we need to keep hearing the same things over and over and over. He says, verse 15, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Didn't he say bond together in peace? It's like he got to keep saying the same thing because we're so hard-headed. And the bad thing about him, I'm going to read this, do all this, and y'all still going to be out of here, a lot of us, and not change. Not address the issues in your life and think that we can hide, or hide it in the depths of our hearts and God don't see it. He can see it. He can see who, he can see the mess. We cannot hide from God. He says, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. That's how we're supposed to do in unity with each other, bond together in peace, bond together. He says, watch this, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God our Father. So everything we do is supposed to be, I'm closing here, everything we do is supposed to bring him glory. It's supposed to bring him glory. My last point, 
Point three. Are you a safe place? And I'm going to read a couple of verses out of the book of John. I'm trying to relate this. Y'all don't understand how you treat others. It's directly related to how God treats you. Who you think you can put out your life. Who you think you can hurt and justify why you do it. I'm trying to get y'all to get this because I, God has given me an alarm in my spirit. Some of y'all about to, y'all think that y'all having a good high life. And y'all have no clue what's, on the, on the, what's down the road for you. And what you don't understand, the person you think you can eliminate from your life is the person that's going to actually save you. And he's saying, that's why I put y'all in uni, because you have no clue. Do y'all know me and Pastor Jordan, this man used to hate me. Bro, I remember pulling up like, oh my God, this little dude outside. I don't know. Can he come out? Like, I'm not going. This dude was crazy. Chased me with Nas. The dude was crazy. I'm serious, bro. <laughs> To where my mama sent these, like, she like, had to be him. Leave him alone. Like, I'm like, this dude, crazy. Now, who would you think? You don't know the enemy is clever. He'll try to kill a relationship. I say this all the time. If he's in it, it's because he's trying to see the future. If he's trying to kill it now, he see the future. Who would have think we would have planted a church together and saved hundreds of souls together? But the enemy knew. He said, if I can get them to hate each other now, this will never work later. John chapter 4, verse 7. Watch this, 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. If you, I mean, but anyone who does not love does not know God. Watch this, for God is love. He is the epitome of love in the essence of what the word is. So he said, if you love people, you know God. He got to be in you. But if you don't, you, have, you don't know him. You, have, you, you live in a lie. He says, verse 9, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that, he may have, so that we may have eternal life through him. This is real love. Real love is giving up something for nothing. Why would you treat him like that? Why would you just let him do that to you? Why would you just, why would you just allow? Why would you make allowances for them like that? Because I love them. Because God loves me. So I'm mandated to be a certain way to them. He says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 11, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. If God loved you that much and did that much for you, now we surely ought to be able to put that around, treat each other with the same love. He says, no one has ever seen God. Watch this. We have never seen God walking down Bannister. He says, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression. When we love each other, have you ever seen somebody do something so incredible like, but it got to be God. That, that man walked up and hugged that woman. I'm like, that's God. That's what I, I want to believe that man got to be a Christian. Because that was the love of God because it would have been very hard for me. If you could, you killed my brother to look at you in your face without, I'd have, I'd have lied. Like, can I hug her, please? And when I got close enough, see the police walked over with him. I would have been like, dang, I was packed off. Like, you killed that was the love of God. Like, I'm going to forgive you no matter what you did to me because that's how he does for me. No matter what I do, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing I do, nobody I sleep with, the bank I rob, the people I murder, God says, I still want you and I love you. I need you to replicate that. He says, verses 18 to 20, let's jump down to 18 to 21. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Are you a safe place for God? Because people are scared of you. They don't even want to talk to you because they know how you act. And they know if they even try to say I'm sorry or something, how are you going to respond? They know, how, they know your attitude. You come in the house, they on tippy toe, because like, they know who you are. That's how I've been before. When I come in the room, I'm like, oh, here you go. You never know what you're going to get. He says, such love has no fear because perfect love expels fear. But in the same breath, we'll say I love you. But everybody walking on eggshells around you. 
He says, if we are afraid, it's for fear of punishment. Watch this. And it shows that we really, that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Now he's talking about, he's talking cross talk now. He says, such love has no fear because perfect love expels fear. He says, you don't have to be scared that if you, if I trump over the trumpet right now, am I going to make it? I kicked it last night. Perfect love expels fear. He says, he says, if we are afraid, it's for fear of punishment. Fear is only because I'm, I'm afraid God going to get me. I, I know I didn't mess up. Oh, it was the time. I screwed it up, too. And we're scared that he's going to punish us. He says, and this shows that we really have not fully experienced his love. You still don't get this yet. You still don't get that out. There's nothing can separate me from you, do you? He says, we love each other because he loved us first. Now, he kind of jumped right to someone else there. He said, it's no fear in our relationship with God that he's going to abandon us or leave us because he has gave, gave a safe place in him. He says, now, we, we love each other because he loved us first. Now, we're supposed to give each other a safe place. We're supposed to replicate that to our brothers and sisters. We'll come to church with an attitude. And then think about it, we'll really walk through the doors. Like knowing that we have an attitude, knowing that we got an issue, and still just act that way. As if, y'all know this is the house of God, and I know other people in other churches have other stuff, but this is, here is actually the house of God for us. We're going to do what the Holy Spirit say do. We're going to make this whole environment conducive to whatever the Word of God said and how the Holy Spirit want to move. Hence why when the worship team say, I need 20 minutes, Pastor, take it, because that's the way the Spirit is moving. They, they do that out of respect for me, but I already told them every day, go for it. If you feel the Spirit, go. I'll shorten the lesson. We'll figure it out. We're going to move so order, of sub, uh, order of service subject to change due to the Holy Spirit's discretion. He may change and say, no, listen, today, let's go to prayer. It needs to be prayer. Listen, people should feel safe with us. People should be running to you because you're a safe place. Because why? God lives with you because he's safe with you. Because you operate in love. He said, verse 20, if someone says, I love God, watch this. Watch this. I'll save this in the last for a reason. If someone says, verse 20, I love God, that's end quote, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? See, it's real easy to say, Lord, I love you, because you ain't actually got to put no work in for real. You think you don't. But the work you put in is with your brother and sister, and that proves that you love him. He's, if, if, uh, he's invisible, God. He's sitting on the throne. We'll see him face to face later. So he left you, your brother and sister, to physically serve, to do to them as you do to God. Because he is love, we love each other because he loved us first. And he says, verse 21, and he has given us this command. So I'm not asking you to go forgive people today. The Bible commands you to go love and forgive. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Oh, Pastor, like, I do love. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 and 5 real quick. This is the rule book for love. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. Well, if you want to go, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, go 4 to 13. I'm going to just read the first two verses. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Boy, we can all get that one. I love you, but everybody's just on your nerves. Just irritated by everything. And, we, and what it gives me, we do it in the church. One thing get off that we don't like. And we're so irritated because my parking lot, spot, seat, the, the worship, I, they talk about me. Just, ir, just, but we swear we love God. Oh, I love God, though. It says, verse 5, we're rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. And some of y'all better dump out y'all y'all, y'all fouls. I got whole pages of what somebody didn't did to you. And we can sit there and recite it over and over and over and over. And y'all may not have physical pain. I'm talking about on your heart. Pages of what that he did to you. Pages of how she did to you. How dad abandoned you. How this happened to you. How this happened to you. And that's all you want to do is live in this repetitive thing. And you don't know that's demonic. 
to sit in that over and over. That is demonic. And what we don't know is our hearts is really, the enemy is very good at what he does. And a lot of us don't know. We think that we're just living for in Jesus and he's blessing us, and we have no clue how far off we are. When you take, you might as well go, get, go down and get you a little doll and start poking pins in it. Straight witchcraft. The way you, the hatred is in your heart, that's what you might as well do. Because every time you spew at them something they did, it's like you taking that little doll of their face and poke, pinching, poking them. We don't even know how we operate in some mess because we won't forgive. He says, there's five things I got to run through this and we're done. There's five things y'all need to leave here with, work with, think about something. Number one. He demands we be a safe place for others. This is a command. You do not have God if you don't have your neighbor. You do not have God if you're not serving your neighbor. I need to do this too. Let me make this simple. John chapter 13, verse 35. That amazing booth may get it fast enough. They may not. John 13, 35. It says, this wasn't on the page, but y'all got to see. Verse 34, I'm going to start at 30 verse. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Man, this is all over the Bible. Man, that team is amazing. Look at that. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How you treat and love each other and serve each other, forgive each other, proves that you really rock with Christ. I know some of the meanest people sitting in the church have been going for 50 years. Some of the meanest, nastiest, rudest. That does not prove because you go to church that you actually are a Christian. Some of us are really just believers. We believe in the cross, but we will not let Christ own our life and our decisions. We won't go back and say, I'm sorry and make it right. But that's what he did for you. Number two. Number one, he demands we be a safe place for others. This is a command. I know we had three verses that said it. Number two, <clears throat> well, pastor, I'll forgive, but not forget. We already talked about that. Love holds no records of wrongdoing. That's nice. So you're not loving if you're still holding on to it. Now here, let me hit this real quick. Some of y'all are going to get out of here and text your ex-boyfriend that's been kicking your behind and punching you and taking your money and using you. Talking about, the pastor said forgive and get it right and reconcile. Y'all be knowing how y'all trying. Listen, forgive him. Yes, he hurt you. Yes, he played you. Yes, he took your money. Yes, he used you. Yes, he wasted the best years of your life. I get it. Forgive him and move on. But do not reconcile a relationship. That don't mean you got to keep letting him knock you upside your head and use you. That's one of those times where you can't reconcile. There's been time in my life where I can't reconcile. I try, I try, it's not a safe place for me. You can't do it. And some of y'all love that I just said that because y'all gonna say, yeah, see, there it go. It's not a safe place for me. It's because you made it unsafe. They didn't make it unsafe. They said sorry. They wanted to fix it. You didn't want to. You wanted to hold on to it. See, unsafe, I gave y'all examples of that. These are abusive relationships, whether mentally abusive, physically abusive. It's real abuse going on. And if y'all want to use that clause and stay in this season of your life, go for it. Or y'all can be honest with yourself. Number three, forgiveness and reconciliation. We just talked about it. Number four, this is one of the sins God hates the most, unforgiveness. It's pride. This is, the root of it is pride. It's taking the place of God, giving ourselves authority to do away with people. Only he has that authority. Number five, last one. Some of us are going to leave here and know what we need to do and still not do it. And then God will be disciplined. And let me say this too. Do not come running to me because I told you. When that thing don't work out like you thought it was, I told you. This is one thing that God is not tolerating. We ain't just treat anybody any kind of way. And think because everything in our life is floating better than it ever has. Warning you now. I'm warning you now. Get it together. Don't let that stuff go. It's going to hurt. This don't mean you don't have pain. It does hurt. I guarantee you when they hit him in the back with the cat of nine tails, 
that was exclusionary. It was, there was exclusionary, exclusionary, excruciating pain. Get your, get your story. I can guarantee you when they beat him and pressed a, a, a thorn, a crown of thorn in his skull, that hurt. But he said, not my will be done, Father, but yours. You don't do this because you just, it always feels good. You do it because it's what God require, requires of you. You want to please him. And you want to release yourself from all this weight in your life. I got a question and we're done. My question of the day. Now that you've heard this sermon, who has God put on your heart that you know you have to forgive and seek forgiveness? Seek forgive or seek forgiveness from? Get the name of your head right now because we all got one. Who do I know I ain't did right? Who do I know I could have fixed it with and I chose to go a different path? Who I know I didn't lie and messed up their they character to people and know it really wasn't like that? Who do I know they really did screw me over really bad? But I know I didn't forgive them like I was supposed to. I know I didn't let it go. And I made choices and did things or didn't do things that I shouldn't have did. I got a whole, I got actually two of them, man. <laughs> Work to do this week. And what you need to start out with is, Lord, I'm sorry. I cannot treat my brothers and sisters one way and think that you're just going to let me skate off with you down, the, down into happy blessing lane. Meaning we get it right with each other. I love this, this, this cross that we have. And I love it. I was about to, it's in the back room. I just didn't want to mess with it today. I, was gonna, I did this last shot. I built this cross on the stage. And I put PVC pipe behind it. And I built it to where a water hop or put a water hose at the top of the cross. And the water comes down and it's valves on each arm. So as the water runs down in the bucket underneath it, the water can run out when the valves are open and runs out the sides of the cross into the other bucket. Pastor John, go give me that cross for me. And this is how it is, this is what God wants from us. As I forgive you and pour into you, I need y'all to pour it out to each other. As I'm filling your bucket with love and forgiveness and grace and blessings, you should be doing it for each other. That's how this goes. Just bring the cross. I just want to show them the cross. I've been moving church stuff all week. I didn't have time. I'm going to just show y'all. Now, when you put the water hose here and water flows, that stuff, I got to fix it. And water flows. Oh, crap. I got to finish it. And as I turn this, as water flows, it goes down into God's bucket into you. What he's asking you to do is open the valves and let it flow into your brothers and sisters. What we do is this, close them vows, but we want to keep receiving from God. We want to just keep receiving all that grace and love from him. But we're going to close off what we do for other people. And he said, if you do this, I do this. When you do this, see, we control these. I to do this. And this is really why some of y'all are about to be so blessed. Y'all open up y'all life to other people. Y'all open up y'all life to y'all church. Y'all open up y'all pocketbooks. And I'm going to talk about this because I'm not a pastor about money. I really don't care about money, but unfortunately we need money to pay lights. And nice 71 degree air conditioning y'all in right now. And y'all, these people will walk to me and say, here, pastor. And slid me hundreds of dollars. These people say, I know what is the church need here. And I talk about this because this is why is y'all did this. Y'all start flowing, letting God flow into you, and you say, I'm going to use what you're, some of what you're giving me to flow into others. So God said, and that's why some of y'all are about to experience some of the blessings y'all are about to experience. Because y'all will lend yourself up to be the hands and the left and the right arms of God. Y'all will lend yourself up to be crucified with him and go in with him. He said, so I give, I'm a pour into who pours into my people. And unfortunately, like I told y'all, some of y'all, y'all do this, and y'all about to get a rude away. He said, okay, the relationship with me is on hold. And I'm like, how's it getting so dark? Why is things happening? It's, I wonder how it's with blessings. There's two ways blessings happen. Sometimes God gives you a vision that something is coming. And he tests, tests how you wait and get to that blessing. And then sometimes God bless you 
before to see if you're faithful with it. He'll give you the blessing. He'll give it to you before you deserved it did anything, just to see how you store it. And then sometimes he'll say, I'm going to bless you to see how you store it the time to the blessing. It's one of the both ways he's going to say, Abraham, leave, go. It's going to happen one of two ways. And some of y'all, it's on both sides that God has promised you things. And he's telling you today, until I can't get you there until you fix this in the middle first. And some of y'all, God has already blessed. And he's saying, don't, don't think I can't take it away. Just as fast as I gave it. Cut, you cut it off? I'm cutting off. God loves you so much. As we read, he says, I love that he says, if you fear some fear of punishment, which means you don't get it, the purpose of God wants us free. He does not want you to walk around here scared of him. He says, I love you so much, I gave my son to die for you. I need you free in that. Ain't no fear in that kind of love, because that's perfect love. It drives out and casts away fear. So if you're here today, like, I'm never, I want to live free. I don't want that fear, that pressure. Like, I want a God who can love me past even when I don't even want him today. He said, I'm still here. He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So us living right has no bearing on his ability to love us anyway. Listen, he says, I leave the 99 for one. In other words, I leave the 99 safe to go get the one who left me who's abandoned and stray. That's how much he loves just the one. And let me make it clear, if it was just one person on this earth that is saying he would still die the same thing because he cares about the one that much. And you say, man, I, I've never really put my faith in Jesus Christ like that. I've always kind of believed, but I just, man, I want to give my life to the Lord today. I don't want to fear anymore. I don't want to be scared of God like that. I'm going to say this again. Salvation is free. That's only what the cross did that provides salvation and right standing with the Father. When we accept that into our life, sanctification ain't free. You want to please God and live a lifestyle of holiness, that's going to cost you. And a lot of y'all that already believe in Jesus, y'all there, y'all trying to live better and live right. Suck this lesson up. Get in the Bible app, hit the three lines, hit events, and save it. And go back through the scripture and say, Lord, speak. I know I need to get this right. Help me, please. It's going to be hard. I got to get it right. I need to reconcile with my brother and my sisters. I got to get this right. And then some of y'all say, I don't know God like that yet. I don't know him like that yet. But today I want to give my life to him. I want a God that forgives me even when I just say, screw you today. He still loves me. I want a God that he, I know I'm standing in and saying he still want to save me. He still want to be here. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open, I'm coming in. I'm always knocking. This imposes that the door is shut in his face. He said, I want to come in your life, and if anybody let me in, I'm coming in. I'm going to sup with him, and he with me. I'm going to have a relationship with you. All for one reason, because I love you. And for the ones that are sticking and giving their life to Christ today, let's say that we're going to save, we're going to move, we're going to start here. You got to start here first. Start here first. If anybody here says, I want to give my life to the Lord today. Never give my life to the Lord. I want today. I want to. I want to confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior of my life. That's what I want to do. I, I want to leave here different, and I want to start a new journey in my life. We're about forgiving your neighbors later. Let's, let's focus now, because He says, "I love you." So since I love you, you love your neighbor. First, you got to receive His love or understand His love. You're gonna need the help of the Holy Spirit to deal with some of this stuff that you're gonna have to battle. So I want to give my life to the Lord today. This is your time. I'm going to ask the minister to come up for a few seconds. Just for anybody. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I believe that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. And I believe he is the one that can save me from myself. And I have to understand that I can't save me from me. I can live, I can never sin again ever in life. And I still need him the same way. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life, it's a gift. It's free. Gifts are free if we believe. I'm going to put the last scripture on the board. I want you to see it. Give me John chapter 3. 
verses 16, 17, 18, if you can. 16, 17, and 18. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that there. He says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that anyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. If you believe in Jesus Christ for the saving of your sins, you will have eternal life. Watch this. God sent his son in the world not to judge the world. He didn't come here to hurt us. He said, watch, but to save it through him. I'm the bridge between you and God. No other man comes to the Father but by through me. So whoever accepts me as Savior gets God. He says, verse 18, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. There is no judgment to anyone who believes in him. You skip judgment because now in the blood of Jesus you have a Passover lamb. Death's going to pass you because now you have Christ pleading for you and representing you. He says, watch, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. I'm sorry, but I can guarantee you it's one way you do go to hell. I can guarantee you it. If you don't believe in Jesus today, make no mistake about it. That's if you die on the street and you didn't accept him as your heart, as your savior of the world, as your savior of, of your sins, if you didn't believe in him as a savior who died and rose, you will die and go to hell. I know old school church told you, if you sin in club, you go to hell. No, you don't. That he's covered that. You're a fool to keep doing it. But, but your belief in him makes you right with him. Your belief in you makes you right with him. And if you ain't never believed, it's your time. You say, I've never believed. Raise your hand. I've never put my faith in him.